everybody, and welcome back to the Chaluminati Podcast, episode 155. As always, I am one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by the Wyatt Earp and Josephine of LA. Whoa. Jesse and Alex. And I have seen Tombstone. I have seen Tombstone. I like that. You have right seen Tombstone. I have seen Tombstone, yes. And you it was went, a cultural phenomenon at the time. And you went, you went Wyatt Earp and Josephine. Yeah. Not Doc the Holliday. Couple. No. Oh. No, the couple. Yeah. Your couple. I'll, okay. I'll be your Huckleberry. Was he? <laughs> I'll be your Wyatt Earp. How about the Maverick and Iceman of L.A.? Oh, Yo, right, there you go. Like, that's, all right. that's something we can all more, get behind. More relative right now in this moment. Yeah. Did you see it? Not yet. I will. Did you see it? No, not yet. Oh, I'm going to see it this week. <sighs> Let's go see it at IMAX. I'm excited. I want to go see it at the big IMAX. <laughs> right? I'm interested <laughs> in all of Tom Cruise's skills. I want to know about his skills. He's very pilot, skilled. Yeah, he's very skilled. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know what else is skillful, Alex? Oh, Take no. A, tell me. Tell me what's skillful. I, I don't you know, know why, I, I'll, I'll I, don't tell know why I did that. I'll tell you what's skillful. <laughs> My ability to segue into a promo for Patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod. A website Get that it. not only is the finest website. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, uh, Alex. What? Yo, <laughs> wait, what just happened there? That's it. He threw us a surprise. He threw us a surprise it's one. That's it. It's not only it. the just finest ch- website. Pause. Awkward pause. It's what? Not, that's, that's, that's it. That's all there that's is it. to say. You go over there. You give us money. We get to keep making this. It comes out every week and it gets to be as good as this every time. At least. Every time. And if you like, I know you, you're, ho- you're home right now. Listen to Shluminati podcast. And, and you're like, this is this is the life. It's going to be this good forever as long as you keep going to <laughs> patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod. Just because be Jesse, better just you give us Jesse, more. The, like, yeah. the more you give us, the better it gets. Yeah. Just because just because yeah. Jesse wanted me to talk about it a little more. Right. No, it's what I wanted for sure. Yeah. Just because he just because he asked me to talk about it some more. I'd like to direct everyone one more time <laughs> to <laughs> patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod, uh, which Thank is a God. website. Stop, stop that. Stop that. <laughs> Stop. Cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, thank you everybody who came out to our live show the, uh, last week. That over was in, that uh, was a Austin. that was a lark. Great if time. I've ever had one. Yeah, it was so much fun. Um, if you were there, you got to see Alex Schill IRL. He shilled to the whole crowd to their raucous applause. Might I add? It, that People did love happen. It. It's like they love it. It's just it's like, like they, love they it. did. In fact. Love it. It's, I, it's it's great. And much like a previous Chiluminati show, I did cut my knee again. And yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't I don't know how it happened. I, I suspect it had something to do with when I got on my hands it's like and knees. It's like the stigmata. That's yeah. what I thought. You got on your hands and knees, which prompted me eventually to get on my hands and knees. And I just want to say a, one of the reviews I, I heard was I saw more of Mathis's underwear <laughs> than I ever expected to see. So I think that says a lot about the show. I, you I, know, you pay what you, you get, what you pay for. Really? That's yeah. true. I got a review that said Alex was wearing a great outfit. Yeah, he was. He was wearing he was an wearing immaculate a fantastic outfit. Fantastic outfit. I got the review from the venue owner that she said, we don't do a lot of podcasts, but of all the ones we've done, yours was by far the best. So Wait, that's what you're what missing out say? on. What can I that's say? what you're missing out Slate on. It. It's because Jesse was wearing his Bucky's bandana. I was time. wearing my Bucky's bandana, and I think I proposed to multiple people that night. Did uh, anyone say yes? Because I mean, you got to throw out multiple fishing nobody lines. Nobody said no. Something. Ooh. Let me tell you, something changes within these men when they step into the limelight on stage. <laughs> Just the, the conversation goes in in places that I, I never. No one's setting out to get there. <laughs> but we always get there. I don't know. I, I it, and it's been it's like every live show. It's not just like it's not just like, oh, something was weird in the water in Austin. <laughs> like it was like exactly. We, we, we always just keep keep circling around it. And and I think that's an appropriate way to describe it. Circling around it uh, <laughs> and like I'm a not drain. Going, yeah, like a drain or <laughs> any other type of hole. And I'm not going to <laughs> what? What are you I'm talking not gonna, about? I'm not going to say what it is that what the conversation you, always trends to? towards. I don't know. I'm not going to I'm not going to name it by name. Hmm. But I will say that it's it's something that can only happen at the live show. And I think that's what's special. You know what I mean? I think that's yeah. What's special? I agree. Patreon.com is slash Chiluminati pod. If you want to see Mathis's underwear. If you want to see Alex dressed in the best outfits, period. (laughs) If you want me 
to seduce you, uh, come to the live show. It all happens. We're going to have so many more. It's going to happen. We're yeah. going to have more. We got a ton of people are like, come this way, come this way. Listen, we can only go so far. Yeah, we can only do so the, with, much. Yeah, we can only do so much. So and if we get close, you got to jump on and, and make the trip like a few people. Do we have somebody from Ireland at this show? I hope that guy made it home. I hope that guy made it home. He looked pretty fucking he looked pretty fucking ragged by the end of his trip. So I hope, <laughs> I hope, he, I hope he got home. OK, <laughs> shout outs. Shout outs on the Reddit if shout you're still out. alive, my dude. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, let's wheel this thing in. Uh, last week, though. Alex, we missed you. Uh, oh. It was your first missed show. And I think at the end, Jesse truly found a deeper appreciation for you as a episode runner when you run your episodes. Oh, is that right? Uh, sure. Who'd you have on? <laughs> we had we had Crendor on we and he ran the show. Crendor. He ran the topic. He took over. Went well, then. Yeah. It was the best show we've done in, in years. Yes. That was the most high pitched I've ever heard Mathis's voice ever go. <laughs> <laughs> he went, yeah, yeah, okay. I was like Jay Leno for a second. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was fun. He, we, if you didn't listen to the Crendor episode one, I did the audio balancing, so it's not great. <laughs> and, uh, and two, uh, Crendor <clears throat> ran the episode and he, he kind of did what I would, I would say is like a weird Alex episode. OK, I kind of did like three, in, three little mysteries, but they weren't really Internet mysteries. They really didn't have anything to do with each other. They were just like some was like a mystery. Some were just kind of like weird facts. And he opened it with uh, a story about you in the car with like blunts in your pocket or something. <laughs> Incredible. I got, I that's, how, listen that's, to this. that's how the episode started. Yeah, I got to find it, out it if I'm about to be canceled started. or not. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was great. It was super great. Uh, but today we're bringing it back. No more. No more. Crendor. We're, we're bringing finishing, it back. We're bringing it back to true crime. We're bringing it back under control under my watchful gaze. It's the final episode all about Boone Helm, the Kentucky cannibal, Yo. which, uh, you know, he's had a wild life these past couple episodes. None and, of this uh, Kentucky cannibal to me. We are still not <laughs> there. I don't know. What, the man is cannibalized everywhere but Kentucky. So if we get to the end of the episode and he never can- cannibalizes within Kentucky, are you going to rename him petition to rename? Uh, again, I'm not going to go that far. I don't care that much. In I'm the just, name of okay. justice. Fuck yes. All right. See, thank you, Alex. At least somebody has some strong I'll convictions down on this on show. Anyone who wants to call this motherfucker the Kentucky the cannibal. If he, if he doesn't eat any, if he doesn't eat anyone at all in the state of Kentucky, we're going to have words. You dead old cannibal. <laughs> Uh, his life moving forward is even more insane than episode two, and uh, it should be fun to talk about. So in today's final episode about Boone Helm, we'll follow the notorious outlaw through his end years and even more madness before we see how his life in the Wild West comes to a fitting end for this bizarre character. And when we last saw Boone Helm, he had just left the company of some distant family, the Johnson brothers, after spending weeks sapping money, drinking like a fish and getting into countless barroom brawls. Remember, he was he would go to each each brother's gold mine on uh, every other day and just kick back, do very little and even bother them. How and they I were forget? notoriously lazy in their own town. It's like a comedy sketch about how much everybody wants to murder somebody. <laughs> like this guy is pushing every button he like takes and takes and takes mm-hmm. and pays no one back and just transgresses and transgresses and leaves society to clean clean up for it at every turn and he, he gets tra- away with it every time he's like a like a negaverse jar jar binks esque character <laughs> i what an interesting description that I think he's like a shadow with red eyes is that weird yeah (laughs) he's the he's the Jar Jar Binks from the stupid ass theory where they're like yo Jar Jar Binks Sith Lord yeah Yeah, Darth Darth Jar Jar yeah it makes sense it makes sense that's who it is it's him it it makes sense (laughs) it's him that's who it is maybe we'll get that when you'll get a Darth Jar Jar miniseries on Disney plus if 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 this guy doesn't eat anybody in the state of Kentucky by the end of this, we're going to change his name to from the Kentucky cannibal to the negaverse Jar Jar Binks. All right, I'm in. I will sign that petition. Thanks to Honey for sponsoring this episode. And today you get quiet, sensual Mike because I am super sick. It's really fun. But the thing I don't want to do when I'm super sick is go out and shop. 
So shopping online is what I do. Not that I don't do that when I'm not sick anyway, but thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupons and saving cash is now a thing of the past, making shopping at home even when I'm sick good for my bank. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 online stores that range from tech and gaming products, popular fashion brands, and even food delivery. The way it works is super simple. When you head out to shop and you hit that checkout button, a Honey button will drop down and ask you to just apply coupons. You click on that, wait a couple of seconds, and as Honey searches for its coupons and applies them to your purchase, you get to watch the prices drop automatically. Whether it be new computer parts for my PC, new parts for my office, or just getting stuff established in my new home, using Honey for the past year has saved me a ton of cash, and I continue to use it on the daily. And you can even have Honey on your iPhone too. Just enable it on Safari and you can find savings on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could straight up be missing out. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting our podcast. I never recommend something I don't use, so get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash chill. That's joinhoney.com slash chill. All right, here we go, continuing. So even though he was getting to countless barroom brawls, the Johnson brothers were also quite violent. It wasn't that that got them him into trouble. It was the cold-blooded murder of a minor in the open streets the day after he couldn't finish his brawl that was the final nail in the coffin. See, this for is what I'm fucking talking about, bro. <laughs> it's a refresher from last episode. Yeah, yeah. Because remember, he got into a brawl, barroom brawl. He got separated and he was so pissed off that he hunted him down the next morning and just shot him in the street. It I was can't. like and killed him. Uh, and with that, he ran off to Oregon before his own reputation caught up with him and he was sent to the gallows. And when pressed what to do after the Johnson brothers had learned of Boone's horrendous crimes, the brothers had decided to keep their mouths shut out of fear of Boone returning and retaliating upon them. Ugh. And so Boone hit the roads of the wilderness once again, doing what he did best, murdering, robbing <laughs> passersby for supplies. And at this point in his life, filling the urge to kill. Doing what he did best. That's like this crazy dude is literally a bridge troll. Yes, very, very a lot of similarities there. Well, in the past two episodes, some could make the argument that while, yes, Boone was a murderer like many back in the Wild West days and a horrendous one, uh, a horrendous one at that who'd be willing to do anything to survive, even eat another human's corpse. It's in this episode, I think we'll see why Boone is more than that, that he's what is I call a true serial killer, one who relished in the process of torture and mur murder when he could. We simply just lack the details of the majority of his crimes out on the road to be 100% sure about it. But the ones we do have details about really lean into the idea that Boone was just a serial killer at heart and the Wild West, much like Tommy Patera's mafia life, was a way for him to fill and live in that life with very little repercussions for decades. Once on the open roads again, Boone quickly found himself among other bandits who tended to stick close to the trading town's roads and who initially planned on robbing Boone when they'd come across him. But more often than not, Boone ended up having a conversation with the would-be bandits, which tended to end in story trading and a safe night within their camp. And before long, Boone ended up building a small reputation among the banditry in the local area. Among the banditry? The yeah. <laughs> I forget this was yes. a different time. I was like, yeah, oh, you know, the yeah. local bandits. In yeah. my mind, it's like hey. a D&D campaign where he just charisma checked his way. Like, you know what? We it's was going to kill you. <laughs> but you got good stories, mate. And so they just let him live. Crazy. But you're right, though, because whispers, whispers of Boone's own stories had already reached out here. Like rumors of the horrible things just he like had done. This fucking asshole. Yeah. And he never would go out of his way to confirm or deny. Always kind of leaving it in the air and I vague as to whether he truly was as terrible as he was. I wonder what the tone is. Like, yeah, I do wonder what those nights are like. like. When, well, I just like when you're telling somebody about this guy, Boone Helm, right? Or like whatever. I hear there's this guy and he's like the dumbest motherfucker. Like, <laughs> like, 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 is it, is it like you better watch out because this monster is out there who could kill you? Or is it like, have you heard about this Darwin Award motherfucking like just failing upwards constantly, asshole idiot? Like, I don't know. Like, do, are people taking him seriously? The the first one, the monster stories were the ones that are more prevalent, especially among other bandits like that. Um, 
And, and Jesse, you're not even that wrong because not only would he be able to ingratiate him in him, himself in their camps, eventually Boone's charismatic persona led him to leading his own small posse of six Stop. bandits and cutthroats that was willing to follow him out to Oregon that he'd plucked from these other groups. So he'd occasionally convince one or two to just stick with him. He's going to Oregon to greener pastures where gold mines are aplenty and they're going to go get rich and settle and all this, you know, the lies he told Littleberry before he shot Poor Littleberry. Littleberry, man. I hate that guy. <laughs> this sucks. Um, yeah, but he got his own little ragtag crew with them that they would stock the roads with. Of the six, we know only the name of one of them. His name was Burton, and we only know his name due to the stories and confessions of Boone himself, though we are certain that they all existed because we have evidence of them, and we'll talk about that later. The others, the other names are just lost to what time. What was the name? Burton. 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 Like Burton. Tim Burton. Yeah. Burton. Yep. That's all we have on his name. Uh, he might have only, only had a, I mean, this is the Wild West. Maybe that was his only name. Do you think all their um, names started with the letter B? Maybe. Boom. Like, Burton. Billy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be great if they did. I can't think of any other B names, though. Brandon. There you uh, go. What else? Brody. Brody. Bucko. You think it was Brody's? Bucko. Bronco. Boyd. Buck. Boyd. Boyd definitely existed back then. Bell, there had to have been. Bell. Oh. Belvedere. Belvedere. Buckle. <laughs> Buckle. Yeah. Well, uh, getting away from the B names before we lose ourselves <laughs> in another, another hole here. Uh, for the crew, the path, the trails leading to Oregon was littered with saloons, way stations, and forts for the crew of criminals to spend their ill-gotten gains at while spending only enough time to cause trouble and fill their stomachs before the whispers of their deeds on the roads caught up to them and the sheriff came knocking on their door. The roads themselves were plentiful, uh, filled with people who were making their way out to Oregon or making their way to California. And so they were constantly robbing and killing people and always had more money than they looked like they should have. The crew often killed those that they had robbed, taking everything of value, but doing very little to hide the corpse left behind, oftentimes just tossing it to the side of the road. And when the world and when the word of dead bodies would reach the town they were in, who else uh, would the eyes trail to than the mess of a group that walked in with way more money and possessions than their attire and hygiene implied? I'm just a guy who likes to walk around with three watches. Yeah, it's like these Come dirty on. ass guys that have really raggedy clothes, blood caked on their hands, completely smelling of the wilderness that have <laughs> hundreds of dollars and things to sell. And they hang out and they spend time in the whorehouses and then they leave and then they come back and they suddenly have more money again. Come on, like, Burton. <laughs> let's find somewhere to put our watches. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, though, their time was ticking and soon their deeds would nearly catch up to them in a small town called da Dales, D-A-L-L-E-S. I always want to say Dallas, but I'm pretty sure it's Dales. The sheriff had already been very suspicious of the crew as they continually rolled into town rich, drinking the town dry and having elaborately long stays at the local whorehouses. Whispers of violent men were, al were always swirling, but recently the deaths in the local area seemed to be climbing. So with his gut feeling guiding him, the sheriff rounded up some men to head out looking for evidence of potential crimes or witnesses who had seen crimes perpetuated by this crew. But before the group of men had even left their stables, word of mouth had already slipped out and Boone had learned of this crew looking for reason to put them behind bars. And what do you think Boone wanted to do? He wanted to murder the sheriff. But now that he was in a crew of other what? people, just let it go. Don't murder I the know, sheriff. I know. I know. How about he not literally was like, murdering the sheriff? Kill him. Yeah. Um, but because he was in a crew, cooler heads did prevail. And instead, they opted to run into the wilderness, escaping the town and the sheriff before anybody returned with evidence. And they did return with evidence of, of local crimes heading back on the road to Oregon where uh, well before they wanted to. And their next destination before reaching there, a place called Camp Floyd in Utah Territory, as the Comstock load had just recently been discovered. And at the time, the area was controlled and ran by the Mormons, who Boone and his crew believed was a land of free money and easy women because they had heard of the polygamy <laughs> that was taking place. This is just the dumbest <laughs> shit ever. I can't 
these guys got three wives? <laughs> yes, that's literally what it was. Come on, Burton. Get our watches. Let's go. <laughs> We're going. Let's get all those watches we've got. All right, buckle. <laughs> let's, let's do Come this on, thing. buckle. Come on, Bismarck. <laughs> oh man. Let's go. And this is like during the time where uh, John Smith was alive and he had recently one day I would love to cover the like the Mormon like r- roots John just Smith. as I, yeah, the, he was alive. No, in Joseph Europe. Smith. Oh, Joseph sorry, Smith. Joseph Smith, not John Smith. Sorry, <laughs> Joseph Smith. He was in this. They had just recently established Salt Lake City, and they were currently uh, at the time having tense arguments with the government because the Comstock load had been found, and the government was opening up that area as though the land was not owned by the Mormons, and the Mormons believed they had owned it because they moved in and took it. So they were having beef with the government at the time. Isn't that just uh, the way it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, he he had heard of easy women and free money, so that's where they were heading. Easy women and free. This it, it free is like money. If this, yeah, the sil- it was a silver mine, a recently discovered silver mine. If this didn't involve murder and eating people, this is like a late '90s teen coming of age comedy. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Except it takes place in the Dalles. Yeah, have you yeah, seen yeah, yeah. the like one and only picture of Boone Helm we have? By the way, no. Uh, you can Google him. I want to. I'm picturing yeah, uh, that guy from Stranger Things. Hold on. Okay. We have like one or two pictures of this man. Boone, uh, Boone Helm. Boone there Helm. he is. You could see him standing uh, against a chair. He's got like a rope hanging from his yeah, jacket. He, he's, he's got. He's he looks so... like that guy from Saturday Night Live. What? Who? Uh, what's uh, the guy who this guy plays looks like a, Eric? Eric, the guy who plays Eric Trump, the don't like that guy. Kind of looks like where that did guy. You message us at? How do we? How do oh, I, I didn't message it. I didn't message it. I uh, said Google it. But I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll link no, you. Right this way. picture just is just this, this picture is just so low resolution. It, yeah, it, it really is. It looks uh, like a ghost in the mirror. Like it's boom. so <laughs> Boonhelm. There he is. He looks it's like him. A it, Lego it, miner guy. If you look him up, minor guy. if you type in Boone Helm and you look him up, he does kind of look like what you would expect from like an 1800s dude. But in the yep. exact same row is another photo of a dude in a top hat and a butcher's outfit. And that is the guy I would think would be the Kentucky cannibal. I feel like that's a work of art. I don't feel like that's a real picture. Don't care. It looks amazing. It's an amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing picture. Now, that guy, <laughs> yeah. I expect to, to eat people. Yeah, well, you know, it uh, makes sense. Yeah, that's Boone Helm. He's, he's a kind of a plain looking dude. Nothing super like stand out. He about literally looks like a matchstick with like a line for a mouth and like two dots for an eyes. Like it looks like, <laughs> you know, that movie, The Snowman. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Yeah, he, he no, looks like yeah, the little he looks like the little snowman from The Snowman. <laughs> he also kind of has like a every confederate general vibe to him you know what i mean like if you give him a look yeah he yeah has honestly it fits because he he espoused uh love for the confederacy yeah that uh, checks out later yeah, that yeah, yeah. sallow dire grim visage but also yeah, like yeah. a ludicrous mustache beard combination yeah <laughs> he's like, like a skeleton face. with skin on and like tassels hanging off his fucking yeah, face yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Looks like that dog that's an Ottoman from Beauty and the Beast, but like on your face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, boys, with the promise of easy women and free money, off they went to Fort, uh, hopefully to get to Fort Floyd. A few days into their travel, as the crew was traveling across the Raft River, suddenly gunshots had flown out from the forest, spewing up splashes of water and setting wooden shrapnel rocketing off tree trunks. Boone and the gang had no immediate visual and had Boone to quickly the run the horses. <laughs> <laughs> Just Would you the like phrase, me to be like Boone the Burton Boone and five and the gang, others? That is like a seventies fop, like funk pop band. Meow, Boone and the gang. Meow, Boone meow. and the gang. <laughs> they have like a chimp as part of their posse for some well, reason. Yeah, of course. <laughs> he helps eat the scraps. <laughs> oh, we got him for the scraps. Yeah, yeah. Burton, yeah. Burton picked him up. He traded him for three watches. He, he eats our scraps. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle doesn't like him though. No, there's that episode where they're all about to be uh, shot down by a criminal. And all of a sudden you just hear bang. The criminal falls over and the camera cuts to a monkey smiling with a pistol in his hand. (laughs) (laughs) That's right, Uh, Bruno. You did good. He's like, (laughs) like I guess you're better for scraps to that one member of the crew who hates the monkey. He's like, I guess you're better than just for eating scraps. Yeah. Finally, Uh, finally melts Buckle's heart, his cold (laughs) anti monkey heart. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, <laughs> so, so, we don't know. 
It's not yeah, known what new, we, Can somebody create like a fan art of like the title screen for this show of like the crew? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Boone and the gang. <laughs> it's just them like riding off, snacking on a human leg. um so yeah the gunshots flew up from the forest they had no visual immediately and they had to quickly run the horses through the river no longer able to take it slow or risk being hit by flying bullets as a trade-off and through just (laughs) enough luck none of the horses slipped or broke a leg and once they once across they bolted into the wilderness desperate to avoid whatever attack was happening and when they finally had enough space and clearing to see who was chasing them it wasn't the law as they were fearing Instead, they learned they had just crossed into Maidu territory, which at what? the time the locals called the Diggers because they ended up living in mat- like mounds and under in like underground. Quote gotcha. Unquote. Interesting. So they were called the Digger Indians, but they were called the Maidu. And that's how I'll be. This just <laughs> became like a JRPG in this episode. Like we're suddenly in like a <laughs> wild situation. I, I, no one's eating anyone. No. I'm so confused. What's we're going getting on there? No, no. We, we ate somebody last episode. That's true. Thanks to Policy Genius for sponsoring this episode. And thank you, Policy Genius, for letting me be sick and allowing to read this ad with a sultry, sick voice. There's somebody out there that's turned on, and hopefully it's you. The world is crazy out there. Whether you're buying yourself a car, renting, or even trying to buy your home, there's a lot to juggle. Luckily, Policy Genius makes it easy to compare insurance quotes from top companies so you can find your lowest price fast. Customers who've used Policy Genius have saved an average of $350 per year on home insurance. And if you're not sure what coverage you need or how to find a low price, then you need Policy Genius. Policy Genius is not an insurance company. They are a marketplace that helps insurance shoppers understand their options, compare quotes across multiple companies, and buy a policy all in one place, no extra stress. It's your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. Click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com slash chill to get yourself started. Policy Genius will show you price estimates for policies that fit your search. If you like what they find, they'll get you switched over for free. The team at Policy Genius are on hand at every step to help make the right decisions with confidence. The Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. Policy Genius doesn't add on extra fees. They don't sell your info to third parties. And Policy Genius has earned thousands of five star reviews across Google and Trustpilot. All you got to do is head to policygenius.com slash chill to get your free home and audio insurance quotes and see how much you could be saving. Again, head to policygenius.com slash chill to get your free home and auto insurance quotes and see how much you could save. More Did than, you forget? Yeah, More it's than like one, one person. Per, that's like that's like a taste test. I'm, where's the cannibal? All right, we're we're getting there. We're getting there. All right. Uh, so they now, once they had sight, uh, they realized we were in Maidu territory, and the Maidu were none too friendly to any white man entering, as they'd had very bloody wars with the encroaching settlers over the years of colonization. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. Gunfire was exchanged between them as Boone continued to run and avoid them, but losing them was proving difficult as they could navigate through the thick woods way more easily and readily than the crew could. They would only slow and stop for camp way late at night, deep into the Oregon wilderness, far from any trail, hours after the last gunshot had been fired. Then and only then did Boone feel it was safe enough to set up a camp. No fire was allowed and total darkness encompassed them. But it was but in his paranoia, Boone still wouldn't let all the men sleep and assigned two men to keep watch at night. They said that they literally couldn't see their hands in front of their faces, how dark it was. And it was chilly. They all had to stick together because winter was starting to encroach. At what this point. fuck situation is this? <laughs> yeah, come on now. <laughs> when morning came, not a peep had been heard and everybody slept through the night relatively safely. And one of the guardmen had uh, stumbled back into camp exhausted, saying it had seen nothing. But when the second one didn't return, they simply walked over to where he was stationed. And there he lie. Throat slit ear to ear and his horse stolen. One of, one of the Maidu had found them, killed him, and taken the horse without anyone, even the other guard, aware whatsoever. Hell yes. That's this is yeah. like a stealth like mission. a righteous version of Predator. Yeah. yeah dude. Right. And he just he took out that one guy, took the horse, and left the crew. He could have killed all of them, and I'm surprised they didn't make an attempt, but no maybe he way. was exhausted That's too. Way. Look, if I had the ability to sneak up on a whole group of people. I want to kill. I you you kill the one, and then you let the rest worry. Oh, that's way worse. 
And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So with little hesitation, the now smaller crew packed their things and very quickly continued their journey in the wilderness, moving in zigzag patterns and trying to move toward Oregon as wilderness as the wilderness in winter encroached. Mm. Boone had to 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 their credit, Boone had spent some time in the wilderness and through sheer survival had some experience. <laughs> But the rest of the he men had experience were ba- literally failing at every turn. Yeah, well, yes, you are correct. But it was more experience than any of the other men had because the rest <laughs> of the men were bandits of the traveled roads. Not a single one had any idea how to survive in the this harsh is like wilderness. Fucking Lord of the Rings. <laughs> we're and only Boone- bandits of the traveled roads. <laughs> These uncharted and- territories are not suitable for our abilities. <laughs> And and so it ended up Boone ended up being their guiding star. <laughs> he was going to be. He keeps their, failing his way. Up. This is fucking nuts. It's crazy to me. This, you know what it is? All of his failures. It's like the idea. It's like the Thomas Edison quote of like, I just learned ninety nine ways not to make it. Like that to me is like, I just learned ninety nine ways not to eat a person. That is yep. how I feel about this dude. Every it's, turn he fails. And then it's like, but I'm here to save you. And you're like, how, bro? How? <laughs> uh, well, with with Boone as their, the one trying to lead them through the wilderness to survive, uh, needless to say, the, the gr- group immediately began wandering <sighs> erratically through the woods, eventually moving in circles. If the Maidu were still following, much like the law from last episode trying to track them, they would have lost them at this point because the there was no logic to the way they were moving. And out of sheer luck, the crew did, after days, eventually stumble across the Bear River, which allowed them to not only get water to drink, but to follow it until they came across a small, abandoned gold rush town called Soda Springs. Soda Springs? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is and this is a JRPG. Lucky. This entire thing we're doing yeah, yeah, right now. Definite, now that you mention it, it definitely comes Soda off like an RPG. Springs, that's like Fallouty. That's like the JRPG town where you go and everyone's like, "Hello, I am an American." Uh, yeah, we are a basic <laughs> level. Get your normal shirt at the shop. <laughs> uh, however, as they stumbled into Soda Springs, it was at this point the snow had already started to fall. And the beginnings of a, a true blizzard had already began to show. And while Boone God, had pressured them damn. to keep moving through the abandoned town because the town had already left for the winter, leaving no supplies behind and to try to keep moving to the next closest fort where he believed people would be. Uh, he was once again outvoted by the crew and they decided to hunker down in the abandoned town of Soda Springs and wait out the blizzard moving when the blizzard passed sure and within hours of them hunkering down snow started piling up and those hours would turn into days so they're like stuck out of curiosity would you try to move forward you're now in the wild west you don't have to be boonhelm you're just trying a guy trying to survive winter's here snow's coming you know like the fort is probably like a couple days travel still away but a blizzard is happening now do you do you try to make it or do you stop and stay i try to ride ahead of the blizzard for sure yeah i mean i would try I, I, is there snow already on the ground it's yeah snow is already starting how delicious is burton i don't he's a he's a man who's been trying to survive in the wilderness with boone oh, i can't imagine he's fit he's tendy if he's delicious mm. if he's delicious i might consider staying yeah i would find i'd be okay. like oh my calf muscle oh I'd we're gonna like, stay here the night i'd be like did you know that uh, we are in Kentucky. <laughs> They're not in Kentucky. Hey, right hey, Burton, come sleep next to me tonight near the fire, near hey. these ropes and wood. Hey, Burton, come smell this rag. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the blizzard did kick him and they quickly were stranded in this town and their supplies would only last them a couple of days. Soon, they were eating the horse's oats, having been out of the supplies that they had, and the horses began to starve. And once they finished off the horse's oats, they began to take the horse meat and after slaughtering their own horses, turning the meat into jerky and eventually resorting to uh, eating leather in their skin as food ran low. This whole time, Boone did not get argumentative. 
He was actually rather amenable and quiet. It was which was interesting to the crew as when arguments tended to happen, Boone loved to jump in. And but then these the, but for here, he seemed to keep to himself. Boone mostly kept to himself, though, because he had a plan. The moment the weather had a break, <laughs> he was going to eat was them intent- all. <laughs> no, actually, the moment the blizzard had a small break, he was intent on leaving and pushing forward with or without them. They would almost certainly slow him down. So he wasn't going to tell them he was leaving. But if but if they did come and find out, he had no intention of helping them if they fell or going back for them. His love and loyalty to the crew that had he had shared so much time with was gone in an instant. Burton was the only one who seemed able to pick up on Boone's intent, and he had no interest in being left behind while the only person with wilderness experience and their leader left. He would show Boone how strong he was and capable of survival he could be, even if the other four weren't. One night, when the blizzard had finally taken a break, Boone quickly scooped up his belongings while the others mostly slept and bounced. Burton, however, was still awake and quietly watched, intent on following him shortly after as not to give himself away and to prove to Boone he could keep up pace. (laughs) That guy guy is asking to be a snack. (laughs) I mean, he he also doesn't want to be stuck with a bunch of people who don't know how to survive in a blizzard. I I heard if you put butter on your skin that it helps you stay warm. (laughs) <laughs> a little salt can keep the moisture. You out. just rub your hands together with olive oil, salt them <laughs> things up and spray it on your body. It'll be delicious. I mean, uh, warm. <laughs> <laughs> Boone realized as he was traveling before long that Burton was following behind him, but he didn't slow down or even acknowledge Burton. And when time for sleep came, Boone pushed on to Fort Hall, choosing not to sleep eating handfuls of snow instead of eating or cracking for ice, cracking the ice to drink. Eventually, through the blowing snow, Fort Hall, the intermediary fort between them and Fort Floyd, came into view. Boone rushed ahead. Burton was still quite far behind. He was excited for a warm bread and proper food and drink. But he, when he reached the entrance of Fort Hall, the reality of the situation crushed him. Fort Hall had also been abandoned for the season, moving somewhere bigger and safer. Winter was supposedly going to be harsh this year, and Fort Hall wasn't willing to risk it. Rushing through the empty stores to see if anybody had left anything behind, Bird <clears throat> Boone only found bare shelves. No supplies remained, and the weather mixed with his exhaustion meant he needed to take a rest and find food fast. Back outside, Burton had come into the view of the fort, but his body had given up. Collapsed into the snow, tired and ready for death. Boone wasn't going to come back for him, he believed, and he was aware of that when he left. He'd gotten so close, but still he'd failed. As the exhaustion began to overwhelm him, he was quickly jostled awake by a pair of arms scooping him up and dragging him toward the fort. When he drearily looked up, he saw Boone's body dragging him uh, ahead. Against all odds, Boone had actually come back to rescue him. He owed Boone his life. Burton would pass out the moment he was brought inside where a small fire was crackling. Finally warm, safe, and away from the blizzard. When he woke up, he was eaten. The end. (laughs) He was a roast with those little leg cap, bone cap things on the ends of his legs like a turkey. (laughs) Yep. Well, that security and comfort would be (laughs) short-lived. As that very night, only after a few mere hours of restful sleep, Burton was woken up with Boone looming over him. In his hand, his bowie knife, now dulled from years of constant use and poor upkeep, glistened in the fire. Burton attempted to say something, but his voice was gone while he could barely move from how weak he was and collapsing in the snow. Boone said nothing before he simply straddled Burton and pressed his dull knife into his thigh. Burton attempted to fight and scream, but he could offer very little resistance. Boone roughly sawed through muscle, tendon, and eventually bone, with Burton in and out of consciousness, screaming and writhing, causing a mess on the floor before he would eventually succumb and pass out once more. Damn. God damn. The next time he awoke, it was the smell of roasting meat that did it. When he looked down to his leg, a tourniquet had been applied to his wounds and the bleeding had stopped. So this man oh, is pain. eating him bit by bit. Yo, <laughs> yo. Whoa. No, the pain this is some Hannibal Lecter immense. shit. Whoa. 
And now with food at the ready, watching his own leg being cooked over a much bigger fire, Boone seemed to lose his feral nature. Once again, jovial and conversational. He was just hyped because he got to eat some leg. Yeah, he's had food. He was no longer starving. You're not you when you're hungry. <laughs> oh, good. You're awake. I made some chili. It's right over here. Hold on. Let me go get some rice. I mean, toast. Well, the story goes that as he woke up and they and Boone attempted to have conversation with him, the smell of meat stirred Burton's stomach and it growled. Boone, very willingly and with a smile on his oh, face, no. cooked up some of his own leg, placed it on a plate, and handed it over to Burton. Whoa. And Burton, with his stomach growling and starvation at his lips, with no choice, ate his own leg. Wow. Oh God. Wow. <laughs> Jesus. I told you he was going to be a proper cannibal at some point. Holy moly. That is like dark, dude. That is yeah. dark. Although, if the three of us were <laughs> trapped somewhere... Yeah. And uh, you guys needed like a part of me. At that point, I'd be like, just give me some. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I mean, yeah, at that point, if we're trapped somewhere and you guys have already attacked me and taken my leg and you're using it to cook, I would just be like, well, if it's there, I think <laughs> I'd be too bitter. <laughs> oh, no, I need my strength for when I killed both of you in your sleep. Oh, my yeah. God. I mean, I mean <laughs> ate that delicious meat meal. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it's a tough man. That was I can't imagine waking up and this just horror movie situation is happening to you. Dude. I guess I would eat my own leg too if I was starving. Yeah, I mean, and, like, if you're I starving, you only got so many choices. And yeah, I mean, like pure instinct is going to take over eventually. Like if you don't eat something and the food is just in front of you, I think I might, so it's tough. I think I might just die before I like turn to eating my own self. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing, so moving from this though, Burton, Burton and Boone were very clearly trapped. The blizzard had picked up once again, snow was piling up and the only source of food they seemed to have was Burton himself. The leg was maintained for days, taking only the meat necessary to cook them of both meals. <clears throat> and Boone would leave every other day to collect firewood and stock it up. Burton knew that if he didn't do something, he was looking at his grave. And so he concocted a plan. He would have to jump Boone when he returned from one of his chores outside. And Boone was still heavily armed and was unable to take all of his weapons with him when he went out. Most importantly, Boone would leave his own personal pistol on the table, which was the least furthest away of where Burton was keep being kept. And so he decided to come up with this plan. One day, when Bert Boone would leave, Burton would go up to the pistol, take it, and when Boone entered the door, he would empty Pop all him. six shots and kill him. Then, if necessary, use Boone's body as a supply source of food, wait out the winter, oh my and when the people ret returned to the fort... Hopefully he would be rescued. This has gone or, from like a JRPG to the thing in like five yeah. seconds. His other option was hope that the other crew made it and ended up finding him. Now, because we won't be returning to this point, I will spoil the rest of the crew didn't make it. <laughs> the only thing that was found of theirs was clothing and bits of bone in the wilderness at different points. And a single buckle. The theory is they tried to go find them when they realized they had both been left behind and were killed and devoured by the wilderness. So we know they exist because we found evidence. Uh, they had found evidence of their bodies, but we didn't have names uh, of them. Or if they did, they were lost to the records of time as time went on. <laughs> so that was his plan. And Boone would, like I said, leave every other day. And he would make attempts on to, and to enact this plan first. First, he wanted to know how long it would take him to reach the pistol. And so the first time he made an attempt to get to the pistol on the table, he barely got about six inches before the agonizing pain from his wound caused him to pass out. Luckily for Boone, or rather luckily for Burton, when Boone returned, his position wasn't too far away from where he was left and Boone didn't have any thoughts about what uh, that he had moved. The second time he left, he decided not to make an attempt to go to the pistol, but instead time how long Boone was left for. So he knew how much time he would typically have left to make this plan work. And finally, on that final attempt, he would make this his action. 
Boone left and Burton dragged himself inch by agonizing inch to the table, biting his lip, trying not to make too much noise. When he moved, he realized he left a huge streak of blood behind him. Now, it was now, now or never. If he didn't get to the pistol, it would become very obvious to Boone what he was trying to do, and he'd likely be killed anyway. So he continued, forcing himself not to pass out, and eventually he reached the table. And as he reached his hand up and palmed for the pistol, he grabbed it, dragged it down, and leaned up against the table to take a breath. He popped open the side to check how many shots he had, and to his dismay, only one bullet sat. This was a problem for Burton. Pistols in this time era were notoriously inaccurate. Guns in general, unless well-maintained, were notoriously inaccurate. And even then, you still weren't looking at pistols of like today. Things needed to be relatively close range. He knew if he walked in that door and he shot Boone and missed a killing shot, he would have, he would be dead. He also knew he didn't have the time to get to the door before Boone returned because the distance from the table to the door was too far and uh, for the amount of pain he was in and to have to drag himself that much further. And so he made a final decision, not willing to risk death at Boone's hand and not willing to sit here and uh, and be food for Boone. Burton lifted the pistol against his into his mouth and pulled the trigger. Wow. (laughs) And so how do we know that? Yeah. Like uh, there's so much like, you just told us a great story, and now I'm like, "Ha! Did Boone tell this story to someone? All Everyone we, else is that, dead." So the only way we know the story is this is what Boone says, because the gunshot from Boone, uh, the gunshot alerted Boone, and Boone went back, and he saw the evidence of what was left. Now, the uh, as far as like whether this is his plan or not, uh, this is all coming from Boone. This is his assumption: is that uh, he Jesus. attempted to. Um, go get the gun and then wait it out. But we don't fully know because everybody other than Boone is dead. Right. This could be Boone trying to build his own kind of story, build his own reputation, because we do know Boone, more than anything, wanted him to be feared and scared. And what better way to say that this that this man was feared and scared of him is that he wouldn't even allow himself to live on a failed plan because Boone scared him that badly. We don't know. All we do know is Boone said he walked in And the man was dead on the ground, a smear of blood leading to the table where his pistol, which only had one bullet in it, uh, laid by the side and he killed it. Well, of course, Uh, killed himself. And this apparently disappointed Boone. While he enjoyed Burton's company, moreover, he had planned to keep Burton alive through the winter, eating him only piece by piece as was necessary to ensure that he got through without dying of starvation. But when he entered the room and saw Burton's body dead, even with the snow banks outside, there was no guarantee that Boone could keep all the meat fresh. So he had to make a decision. And the decision was to cut off the other leg and take it with him into the wilderness. No longer willing to stay in this place because he, he would be served better on the road where maybe, just maybe, if he ran out of food, he could forage and try and survive. This is think he's, so fucked up. Do you think he's smart enough to tell this story about how the dude killed himself so that he can get off with just the dismemberment and not the murder. You know what I mean? Like a murder charge versus like he's like, he's like trumping it up in a way. Yeah. I, I would say yes, but works. no, because he already had crimes of murder behind him and those were following him. No he, reason. Still no making reason their way not Man, to, I guess you're right. Yeah. If he's trying to make a, uh, yeah, it's interesting, man. That's yeah. This guy's a, uh, it's, obviously you can't take worse word for for everything here but if you look at what we know in terms of the facts of like is the 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 warrants of his arrest were following him everywhere Mm -hmm. and at least to a degree the story fits like why wouldn't he just take on this murder uh he was he was willing to take him on before it's all speculation i don't know well out here in texas grilling season has officially begun and every time i step outside Somebody's cooking something delicious somewhere on my block. Oh, uh, and thanks to ButcherBox for sponsoring this episode. I am just about through all the meat they finally sent me, and there's not a single one that I haven't loved. The bacon may have been my favorite, but that's simply because I'm a bacon boy. And ButcherBox saves me a lot of time and money. You can get cooking this spring with the best meat on the planet. 
What ButcherBox is, is a simple subscription service that delivers high quality meat and seafood right to your doorstep. You get to choose from a carefully curated selection of 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, wild-caught seafood, and more. And right now, new subscribers can receive a free grilling bundle in their first order. It's the convenience for me that makes me love ButcherBox so much. And with ButcherBox, every month they'll ship a curated selection of high-quality meat right to your home, free shipping for the continental U.S. No antibiotics or added hormones, packed fresh and shipped frozen for convenience so you can save time on your next grocery store trip, and customize your own box or go with one of theirs. Either way, you get exactly what you want. With ButcherBox, you're spending less than $6 per average on every meal. Kick off grilling season right with ButcherBox. Sign up at butcherbox.com chill to receive a free grilling bundle on your first order. You'll get two 10-ounce ribeyes, five pounds of chicken drumsticks, and a pack of burgers for free. That's butcherbox.com slash chill to claim this deal. Um, again, I think this is also probably true because we'll we'll talk about it a little later in the episode, but the man truly did love to torture. He, when he had the opportunity to torture living people and get away with it consequence free, he did it hmm. almost every time. And we'll look at that uh, in the future. Regardless, at this point, Boone entered the, wil the winter wilderness again, continuing his journey toward the land of easy women and free money. <laughs> and those days turned into weeks and probably unsurprising to the two of you, Boone's natural ability to survive in the wilderness hadn't gotten much better. <laughs> he tried to forage and hunt to very little success when he ran out of leg meat, and soon he was cursing himself for not at least taking another piece with him on the desperate need of needing to eat again. But then he lived. He did. He did <laughs> live. So because eventually, so Boone stupid. stumbled into the, the territory of the Shoshone uh, native group. And the Shoshone had a tense peace with the Mormon people not too far away. He not only stumbled into their camp, but wordlessly sat down at a log at a fire. And the Shoshone, not willing to risk the peace they had with the Mormons, took care of him. And for days upon days, the Shoshone took care of Boone, feeding him, giving him warmth until a nearby traveler, a traveling merchant came by. And they were at that point, very desperate to get rid of Boone because he had become a nuisance. He was eating everyone. Yeah. And so in a very quick deal for the deal of a few extra furs, he was willing to quote unquote, take Boone off of their hands. And uh, with that, he was saved. And the next part of Boone's story is mind blowing. The, the next man, part? The ne <laughs> Finally, something mind blowing and weird and unexpected. Yeah, I it was, know, it was right, slow right. up until I, then. It's I don't. <laughs> so it's nuts what ends up happening uh, next to this man, because his his life seems to only get better from this point on what does that for, what could that possibly mean <laughs> a little a little bit for them i mean <laughs> okay so he's as he gets taken away from the shoshone traveling with the nearby merchant they begin to make way toward the Mo the mormon settlement the merchant seeing a man in desperate need perhaps even a madman takes care of him offers him food fresh clothing water and asks for nothing in return he is quite literally kind of babysat by this man. And what little conversation he was able to have with Boone, he never pressed. The kindness was free and he was able to drink his fair share of, of whiskey all along the way. Eventually, though, he was brought into Salt Lake City and it would be not too long before he himself got into another fight, finding himself in the, in the Mormon version of jail. But the Mormon town version of jail wasn't jail, gentlemen. It was the basement of the mayor's house with his family, where he got a warm bed, three warm meals a day, conversation and company, where he would have discussions with his mayor about his daughters, his family and the town nearby. What? And the word and whispers of Boone's life would creep their way into the ears of these people. But instead of a criminal, they saw an opportunity. Boone was a man of no morals. And the town, uh, uh, should I say, in Salt Lake City was a town 
divided Mormons and Christians. And in a way, they saw Boone as a hitman. No. <laughs> what in the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Is there a part four to this? <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, I, we, we, I really could go part four. I wasn't planning on it. Um, we may have to go part four because we're going into what the we're fuck? about to hit an hour and we haven't gotten to the part Mormon where Boba Boone Fett? shacks up, where Boone gets to live with for weeks with a millionaire. What are you talking guest. about? What is this happening? How is this possible? <laughs> um, I was the plan was to quickly go over the next bits of his life. But he's a quickly. Mormon hitman and shacks up with a millionaire. <laughs> He's still only eating two people. How does he get a fucking animal? There's so, there's so many questions. <laughs> yeah, the Mormon elders saw Boone as a sort of unofficial answer to their prayers. He was not just a murderer for hire, but one who was known throughout the world, the land as a half mad killer who'd slaughter a man for so much as looking at him. He was who'd slaughter. <laughs> he was the perfect patsy, a wild dog that could be trusted to savage the beast that already ran free in their town. You know what? <laughs> I don't. I'm going to say something I think's controversial, but I'm starting to think organized religion is more about the organization than the religion. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what that's. I'm starting to get weird vibes from this. You tell him, Josephine. Basically, remember how I said earlier, the, the, the issue here for the Mormons was that the U.S. government had come in and basically taken land that they deemed themselves free for any of the colonizers to move in and take. And two pieces of land had been taken by two rich Christian men that they desired, parts of the, the silver mine that they had just discovered. And they wanted to do is have Boone go kill them so they could go <laughs> take the land for themselves. And then they would reward Boone with safety, a life. And uh, and basically the comforts of Salt Lake City that he believed he was entitled to for moving into this city. Safety and a life in the comforts of Salt Lake City. Yeah. And Boone, they, they did also bribe him by getting him drunk. And it didn't take much Wait, for Boone to. What is the Mormon stance on alcohol? Oh, don't I'm tell anyone. If you, no, no. If you drink it, do ne never tell anyone. Take it to your grave. So the they're Mormon like, stand they're like. <laughs> Uh, you know, get him all that alcohol without drinking. Like, okay, Joseph, this is See, that's, crazy. That's the great thing about having a religion where your rules can change depending on the leader. Anything can become. Uh, you, mean, can you mean every religion? Every yeah, single yeah, religion, cool, depending cool on who's prophecies. leading it, you can change it however you want. See, the Mormons were smart is that they like they didn't end up building like an end date into their religion. Like a lot of other cults do. Like Scientology was smart that way, too. Like something that started as like a small cult and then became a religion. I don't want that uh, taken out of context for you, my man. I don't want to get a call like, hi, we're with the Church of Scientology. Are you interested? Oh, bring Church of, Church of Scientology is a huge fucking Ponzi scheme cult. It's just any, any religion that requires money to remove up in the ranks. Every religion is like that. Don't get me started. I'm very anti-religious and I'm very, very loud about it. I grew up Christian for fucking 20 years. It's anyway. Uh, I don't want to, you're going to get me. <laughs> rambling about how awful it is um the next episode I, of the show enjoyed, i'm just gonna say the word religion to mathis yeah, yeah. <laughs> i enjoyed how it set you off so quickly too you're well, like catholicism yeah. is a cult within a cult it's like a niche cult that makes you hate yourself as part of its religion <laughs> like a good niche you. cult every now and yeah. again <laughs> guilt and punishment and constant oh, catholicism you mean yes catholicism that's what i grew up i grew up catholic like uh, that's what well, i grew up there, it's, there's it's, your problem it's awful i'm gonna i'm gonna just uh, reach out to you and tell you i too was was raised catholic mathis i feel you i was a methodist we were all good we were like you doing good all right yeah i'm doing all right we didn't have any of that it was like pretty chill i'm not gonna lie <laughs> pretty chill so it was pretty uh, chill we weren't you know we were like jesus is a pretty cool dude he was like all right, jesus, was all right. jesus is a really neat guy yeah that's what it was it was like all right it wasn't a lot of like and you're going now, to hell. A lot of going to hell. Yeah, now you're you, going to hell. I didn't have a lot of that as a kid. You're going to hell for a lot of things, man. There's a lot of reasons I was going to go to hell, and it was uh, uh, man, pretty sure off, the man, devil I was going gave to me hell. powers is a gateway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's get through this next piece, and then Do you we'll think the church would wanted... approve of you trying to bang a succubus? Is that is that a thing? <laughs> Absolutely not. They'd be so mad. <laughs> but they also told me Satan was filled with like 
bargaining and like wanting souls. And that's why I was like, well, maybe Satan will let me be a power ranger if I bargain my soul. Nah, it didn't work like that. Nah, you ain't about that. <laughs> Satan will let you be a power ranger. <laughs> Listen, I was a kid. What do you want? Yeah. I was just, <laughs> just, you know, whatever. <laughs> if anything, your time in religion, it's it taught me that you saw, oh, I could just reach out to this devil guy because like, He's clearly very real and more importantly, going to help me become a power ranger for my soul. And you were willing to do that. The lesson you learned from years of being Catholic was that you can phone up the devil and become a power ranger. That's what you took away. <clears throat> yeah. And, you're, and on your deathbed, you can ask for forgiveness and you'll just go to heaven. Ah, boy, that's it all seems like a scam it's to me. It's like it's all it's almost like, uh, you know, like during the time of the medieval era, especially during the Black Plague, you could pay priests money for a ticket into heaven. Yeah. Catholicism, baby. All right, <laughs> let's uh, let's move forward. So the Mormons did, with a little bit of liquor and some money and the promise of safety, <laughs> hired Boone to kill these two men who took land that they believed were theirs. I cannot believe How that this is happening. I'm sorry. I just had however to, uh, yeah. they had a, they had assumed that Boone would take a more stealth stealthy approach, more nuanced and yeah, subtle approach yeah, to murdering these men. How do you think Boone handled this? Probably not well. He probably <laughs> yeah, walked yeah. up to them in the middle of the street and fucking shot him in the face. <laughs> well, you are correct. The first victim, <laughs> the first victim, Amazing. Boone simply strolled up behind him while he was blind drunk, pissing on the side of a trading post, placed the barrel of his pistol against his head and simply pulled the trigger. Jesus. News of that brutal kill had only just reached the other target when he caught sight of Boone walking down the street with murder in his eyes. But he, instead of trying to stand up and fight Boone, he tried to get away, which caused Boone to just raise his pistol and empty every single shot. And while a bunch of shots missed, not enough of them did. And he also fell dead in the road from Boone's pistol. When Boone returned, he expected a reward, a good job and a pat on the back, everything he was promised. Instead, when the sheriff brought him to their building with him claiming that they had hired them, they denied everything. This place still had laws and they could not uh, end up being in trouble with the sheriff for Boone's actions. And so Boone was thrown in prison. Now, the question is, gentlemen, do we go to a part four or do we push, I'd say, another 30 to 40 minutes and wrap up this story? That is so insane to me that there's that you, much more. You can't. All right. Here's what I'll say. Even though for the love of God, I'd love to wrap this up. I will <laughs> say that I feel it would be an injustice for us not to really look at dive this. into like, yeah. you're telling me that there's more to this. And not only that, it's more insane. And he's still only eating two people. I'm expecting more people to be eaten. I, <laughs> he ends up with a millionaire. Oh, there's so much going on here. I, I feel like we have to part four. <laughs> All right. We'll wrap this thing up next week with a final bit, but it'll allow me to go into more detail Man. of his life as a, we'll say his life living with a millionaire and his life as a, as a soldier. How? As a soldier. <laughs> I was going to get through the soldier part really quickly today. I was just going to be like some brief details, but we'll talk a little bit I more about it next more. week. Yeah, this is How fucking nuts. How are we nuts. doing this? Four parts on this man. That's, that's what nuts. I always say. This is something say. I expected two parts at most, and we're going on to part this four. That's what I, I will say. say. Out of all of our, our <laughs> killers slash whatever we're, we do on this podcast, I am by far the most entertained by Boone's adventures. I can't even. <laughs> it's just like a it's like a serial. Like, and like there's like it's like different writers come in and take a different story arc each time. <laughs> it really is. It's like we are on season four of True Detective now. You remember it's Little Barry a different Shoot? turn. Remember that guy? <laughs> Where, what happened to him? Remember, that's like a whole other. That was the start of it all. That was, that's a whole other character. <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> I just like I don't. Oh man, if there's like. We're at we're definitely at the end of this man's life. Like we're we're coming to the end. There's a couple more big bits like the the millionaire and stuff like that. But uh, things spiral for Boone pretty quickly toward the end here. But yeah, he's gonna meet up with a man by the name of Dirty Harris. Dirty <laughs> Harris, get, get the fuck out of here. That's like <laughs> off brand. <laughs> it's like the Hydrox of like Dirty Harry. Dirty. Yeah, he's got a he's got a man. <laughs> All right, man stop of Dirty Harry. Stop spoiling. You got to shut up and just 
I had a whole little episode. bit of script left to go. I had more <clears throat> written down. Do not spoil uh, any more. That was already too much. That was. I can't believe the names associated with this story. A soldier, Dirty Harris, and I'll give you one more name: Dirty Harris and Old Tex. Old Tex. O L E. Old Tex. Does he own a mill? <laughs> Uh, you'll, have, you'll have to, I guess, see next week. <laughs> this, I'm gonna tell him this man's whole life right. story. Yeah. I usually yeah. don't go God. whole life story. Then nobody's <laughs> life is really like this. <laughs> I can't, like he's a bad guy, but three my finger God. Jack. He's a character. He uh, is a all character. Right, all right, all right. Wow. Anyway, all right, all right. I guess we're stopping. I guess we're stopping. I guess we're not ending his story today. <laughs> I feel like it did John Wayne Gacy. Less of a service by guy. doing all he did was being awful. Boom hell. Yeah, this fuck that dude guy. lived. He was a bad man, but he lived a life. Oh my <laughs> god, this is insane. Oh, I cannot. All right, all right. Next week may not be a full hour though, depending. Like we really aren't that. Like we don't. I don't know if I have an hour's worth of content I to move forward we do. here. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> all right y'all well, we're off to do a mini sode over at patreon.com slash illuminati pod we will be finishing boon hell next week gonna, i cannot uh, believe i'm talk saying about that. jfk in the mini sode see you there all right we'll leave it at that thank you so much for listening goodbye Bye. anyway me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night enjoying ourselves i needed to go to the bathroom so i stepped back inside and after a few moments i hear my wife go holy shit get out here so I quickly dash back outside, and she's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky.